a couple of things I'd like to say before I start, and that is this is supposed to be a seminar, not a lecture. So I'd welcome it if anybody could chip in at any time and say, don't agree with that, or what about that, or whatever. So please feel free at any time. We don't have to finish a particular agenda, so there's no problem there. The second thing is that, um, well, this paper was actually originally written for an information systems conference, and then uh, the journal that went with it. And the editor of the Applied Earth Sciences here in Australia saw it and asked if we got permission to reprint it in Applied Earth Sciences. And I think John picked up on that and said, would I give a seminar? So it's a little bit out of the ordinary for what you're getting, um, and I hope, hope that doesn't matter too much. Um, we'll end up with Earth Science applications. Uh, the earlier stuff I'm going to talk about is other industries, but I think they may in some cases have quite a bit of relevance to what you do. And to bookend it properly, I'll start off with a bit of Earth Sciences history to begin with, which is uh, basically what I started with. Um, I, when I went to Cambridge to, to do natural sciences with physics, chemistry, and maths, you had to pick a third science. So I picked geology because it had uh, excursions on a Sunday afternoon that ended up very convivially at the pub, and that seemed as good a reason to pick it rather than crystallography. So that led eventually to being a geophysicist, I went off and did my master's at MIT and came back. And uh, coming back to Cambridge, uh, my supervisor, uh, Edward Bullard, put me on to um, doing the first quantitative fit of the continents around the Atlantic, uh, which came up with that. We had to do the spherical geometry of it. And uh, actually, um, we had, because we had no digitizers in those days, we had to hand digitize the Times Atlas, which took quite a while, and then uh, do all the spherical geometry on a thing called EDSAC, where you put punch paper tape into um, a computer that was about the size of this room that was consisting of valves and or vacuum tubes. And as a research student, you could book half an hour at two in the morning. And if you punched your holes wrong, you had to come back the next week and do it again. So things have only got easier. But that was only part of my PhD. And the other part was building a three-dimensional proton magnetometer for magnetotelluric work. And in case you're not familiar with this, um, a proton magnetometer basically consists of a bottle of water, and you put a large electric current, you put a big current through this coil of wire around it, and that lines up all the protons, and when you let go of the current, the protons process at a frequency which is proportional to the magnetic field. And that measures the total magnetic field, and if you want to get it three-dimensional, real string and uh, ceiling wax stuff, we uh, cast these spheres out of araldite and put them at two right angles around the bottle. And uh, so we ended up with a system like that. Uh, and we pulsed it, so it punched out on paper tape every 12 seconds. And uh, we recorded variations in the Earth's magnetic field with the purpose of looking at electrical conductivity structure as because the longer the period, the deeper into the ground the, the waves progress. Anyway, um, built all this in a way that would, this whole caboodle would probably be a little box that would fit in your pocket nowadays. But uh, I did end up with a lot of soldering burns on my hands making it. And uh, Prof. Jager from Canberra was visiting, and so he gave me a postdoctorate at the ANU to build some more equipment like this. And uh, I ended up doing a survey across Western Australia. Uh, and when I went back to Canberra and had a family that always said, what are you going to do when you grow up? Um, I, and they were over here from Wapit, which is now Chevron, were recruiting geophysicists, so I got a job as a geophysicist, and then later worked for Woodside. And because I had a computer background, they put me on project evaluations, uh, which meant I found myself arguing with accountants, losing arguments with accountants. I went off to this university and did a, a BCom. They didn't yet have the MBA and then a master's. And then um, part-time while still working. Luckily, Woodside's office was in Sterling Highway, and we're using ICL in West Perth. So I could make a kind of triangular trade between the university, the, the computer center, and, and Woodside's office. So um, I, I found myself arguing with accountants. Uh, but by the time I'd finished the economics and commerce degrees, I um, had young kids, and uh, field work wasn't quite so attractive. And so uh, they were starting the MBA course here. And so for 30 years, I worked in the business school. Now, one problem of working in the business, uh, coming back as an academic when you've worked in industry, is that you, well, two problems. One is I'd come into a field that was other than my own. And one beautiful thing they still had then, which has died the death in most universities, was a coffee room where we actually sat and talked to each other. 
and you could get talking to people with other disciplines and get involved in things where you could bring something to them and they brought something to you and you could end up with joint work. The other thing was that uh, you took an enormous uh, cut in salary when you came back to university from industry and um, so one had a motivation to do some consulting. And from that work, which I did over 30 years with various organizations, I found that very often we meet paradigms in industry that are not really appropriate. And organizations are often using paradigms that are out of date, or maybe not out of date, but out of context, inappropriate to the current situation. They've picked up a toolkit and shoved it in somewhere where it's not quite the right toolkit. Or based on anecdote or insufficient evidence. Or just plain wrong. And they often arise from a failure to realize potential available information technology. That um, very often people have been doing things the way they've been doing them for a long time and haven't realized that possibly they could um, do them a little better if they took account of what the computer can do for you now. Having said that, one's got to be very careful because you come into a company, uh, you've been invited to do some consulting work, they've got a lot of knowledge you haven't got and you've got to respect that, what one might call domain knowledge. If you, if you don't respect that, then you can immediately look ridiculous. So you've got to be very careful to respect the domain knowledge they have and they may not be putting it in a way that you would put it, but um, there may be knowledge there that you need to get hold of. And also local sensitivities. Very often if you get called in a consulting job, it's because there's some sort of turf war going on. And um, different groups may be pitted against one another. And you've got to be very careful not to tread on the wrong toes. And to get changes adopted, you've got to use a lot of psychology as well as science. And you've got to work with rather than for the client. Uh, a couple of times I came a cropper and I found it was, well, looking back on it, it was generally because I'd taken a problem, as stated by the client, gone off and tried to solve it and come back with a solution. And that has a lot of, not only factual problems, that one might not have grasped the problem correctly, but also psychological ones, that you don't then have the client with ownership of it. You've got to work with them rather than for them, so you're actually helping them. And I think also one secret is to start simply and expand reluctantly. If somebody presents you with a problem that appears to be quite a huge problem, don't aim for solving it all, but try and find some facet of it that you can work on with them. And then if they say, but well, wouldn't it be nice if we could do this? You respond with, do you really need that? And if they insist, then you expand it. But you reluctantly expand it rather than trying to overreach. And there are some cliches that are trite but are true. And one is client ownership. That you've got to have the client owning the project rather than um, you're presenting them with something or selling them something. And you're a facilitator. You're helping them solve the problem. You're not actually solving the problem for them. And some examples of this paradigm shift that I was talking about. There's a story that up until the um, 1950s or 60s, Whenever the British Army fi fired a gun, there was a man standing alongside. And the reason the man was standing alongside was that was because standing orders said so. And every time they revised standing orders, they carried that forward. The man was there stand standing alongside the gun. Until somebody went back and back and back. And when they got back to the Boer War, they found that he was there to hold the horses, to make sure they didn't shy. So that was a case where the paradigm had changed. There were no horses any longer, but one aspect of it had stayed on. And because nobody was doing any cost-effective analysis of this, um, it, it stayed on and stayed on. Another example closer to home, not long ago I had a CT scan. And um, when I had had it done, uh, they gave me this um, plastic uh, film inside an envelope and said, this is for you. I said, fine, do I take that to the doctor? And they said, oh no, we'll be sending her an electronic version. So what's it for? Oh, we have to give that to the patient. Now, they must cost quite a bit to produce plastic films like that. It's still behind my bookshelf, sitting there. It must have cost a fair bit to produce. 
And I think one of the problems here is the fact that it didn't actually cost anybody directly. It came out of Medicare, and um, if it's everybody's responsibility, it's nobody's responsibility. And so there was no reason for anybody to think, oh, that's an unnecessary expense, why do we do it? Coming back to some, the very first consulting job that I got when I was working in the economics and commerce faculty here was, um, well, you, one had to take any job that came along, and uh, the head of department came up with this job for me, that um, there was a firm in West Perth that isn't there any longer that used to make cardboard boxes. And the way you make a cardboard box is to make rectangles of cardboard with three rolls of paper, and the middle roll travels a little faster, so it comes out corrugated, and you cut it into rectangles and make the boxes. And the problem, well, in fact, the problem as presented was uh, what stocks of paper should we keep so that over the year we minimize the amount of um, paper we stock and we always have it available. And one big problem was they had such enormous stock of paper that the particular roll they'd need that day might be buried so deep that they spent half the day with a forklift truck trying to get hold of it. So um, the question was, the question as posed was, what, what um, size paper should we stock? And then you get to some very knotty problems because, for example, they were providing cardboard boxes for two different fish um, exporters who were exporting exactly the same weight boxes but of uh, different dimensions. And the operation could be much facilitated if you could uh, persuade them both to have the same dimensions. But when you looked into it, each of the uh, fish exporters had different... Um, equipment, different uh, pl uh, wooden platforms that they put the stuff on and shipped it out on, and they'd have to change a lot of their capital equipment before they could comply. So we looked at, uh, while, while looking at it, we came upon a much simpler problem, and that was, how did you actually choose each morning the rolls of paper that you would use for making your cord cardboard boxes? And you could either make them single ply, or you could make them double ply, so that they were two widths, or three widths even, and the objective is clearly to minimize your waste, or one of the objectives. And the chap who was doing it each morning was choosing the minimum waste. So he'd, he'd pick a single ply with 30 millimeters waste rather than a double ply with 50 millimeters waste. So his paradigm was wrong. He was looking at the absolute waste on the width rather than the proportional waste. You can see that if, if you have 50 millimeters but you get two widths coming out, there's actually less waste than if you have 30 milli millimeters and only a single waste. And so it's kind of obvious when you realize that. But then the tricky thing was, how do you actually change what they're doing? This fellow had been doing it for 20 years. And uh, it wasn't very politic to go to him and say, look, you've been doing this wrong, and you've been wasting your time. And the, chap, the young chap I was working with was actually uh, came up with a great idea, and that was, let's get an apprentice explain to the apprentice what to do. Let's go to the man himself and say, look, this is a pretty routine task. You're doing a lot of other decisions during the day. Why don't we uh, hand this over to an apprentice since it's pretty routine and you can get on with other things? So we took the apprentice aside, explained to him what needed to be done, and from then on, they not only minimized the proportional waste, but also would take account of the fact that it was a lot more economic to run two at once than, than a single one or even three widths. So, um, the psychological side of it uh, was far more important than the actually solving the sum or realizing that proportional waste was what you wanted to minimize rather than absolute waste. Another problem, another problem that came upon fairly early, uh, uh, an economist and I were asked to look into by the West, West Australian Railways. They were having trouble with the freight up to Geraldton and they wanted to look into why there were so many delays on the freight and so forth. But even to, get, even to get started, we wanted to plot up train weight against how long the train was in wagons. And we found there was very poor correlation. And we got them together to talk about it. And uh, they uh, actually, there were a mix of people in the room, all from the West, West Australian Railways, and they were saying, look, uh, let's actually look at some records. And they looked at this train record, and one older bloke said, oh, it was so many wagons. And, an older, and a young fellow said, oh, no, that's not right. It's half as many wagons. And in fact, it turned out that all the, wagon, all the trains that had been measured by younger staff fitted quite well to this line, 
And all the trains that had been fitted by older staff fitted quite well to that line, with half the slope. And the reason why it turned out in conversation, because they'd never talked to each other about this, one of the elementary jobs you were do, told to do uh, in the morning was to go out and measure the length of that train by counting the number of wagons. And over the years, short wagons had got replaced by double length wagons. So whereas an older man would count one, two, three, four, five, and as the longer wagons came in, he'd count one, two, three, four for the longer wagon, five, six, seven, and then eventually the shorter wagons had all disappeared, and if you're below a certain way, age, you just come in and count the uh, wagons as one, two, three, because you'd never seen the shorter ones. And these two cultures have been quite happily carrying on together in parallel. So they've been collecting a lot of data, which you couldn't really do much with unless you unscrambled that problem. And we did, and it helped us uh, go on to the next stage, which I won't go into. Um, one time we got a call from a uh, cigarette company in Surabaya. And um, their problem, they'd been using a simulation package that actually a couple of us had done some publication in. They'd seen that we published, uh, that we'd used it. And they'd got this simulation package. It wasn't in Excel like I'd normally do nowadays, but it was a specialized package. And they'd been trying to simulate um, uh, the production of their filter tip manufacturing. And they'd written the program, and it apparently worked fine, but the trouble was it took about eight hours, or it took, a day, uh, it took more than a day to run just to simulate a day's production, which spoils the purpose of a simulation package. You want to be able to move a little quicker than real time. And it turned out that what they were doing was simulating each filter tip as a discrete event. And you can think of the millions of filter tips that were being produced. And if you actually computed each one, it took longer than it took to make a filter tip. And uh, if, if you treated the flow of filter tips as a flow, rather than a series of discrete events, the things uh, speeded up no end. And what they were doing was equivalent to using uh, Einstein's for, um, theories for taking, you know, tracking a ball rolling down an inclined plane. Newton's laws are fine. You don't need to use Einstein for that kind of case. A second lesson that came out of that was a need for timely response. And I think if you're an academic and you're consulting for industry, one, uh, I've noticed it with colleagues, the sense of time is very different in the two. An academic will spend six months working on a project and then write up a paper and then get it published, maybe if he's lucky. But um, in industry, they probably want the answer now, if not yesterday. And uh, in this particular case, they rang up on Thursday. Ramadan was coming on, so that was not going to be possible in a week or two because every, everything shut up uh, at this factory. Uh, our term was coming on a week later or so. They rang up on Thursday, and I was on a plane on Sunday. And I think you need to actually be able to respond like that if you're going to work with industry. It doesn't do to um, take the academic, slow approach. Um, we're getting closer to uh, earth sciences now because the next example I'm going to talk about, although it's got nothing to do with mining, uh, actually turned out to be applicable to mining later. And the problem here was the hospital linen laundry service. Now, the hospital linen laundry service, I don't think it exists any longer, but um, 20 years ago, it uh, serviced um, laundry for a whole lot of government institutions. It was a state body, it was a big laundry, smelt like a cheese factory, and it uh, took laundry from prisons, hospitals, all sorts of government institutions, laundered them and sent them back. And it had been doing it as a service. And in the 80s, the magic word was accountability. So this organization now had to be accountable, and it had to charge an appropriate amount to each institution. The appropriate amount for the amount of sheets from the hospital, the amount of um, nurses' uniforms, the amount of uh, so, um, operating theater um, linen, and so forth. And so it had to be able to give a price for each type, based on cost. But how did you actually cost it? Because they put a mix of laundry through every day, and yet, you wanted to charge individual items. You knew what it cost to run the laundry for a day, but um, that didn't really tell you how much it cost to run each individual item. And it actually turns out, given that the daily production being a mix of types, so long as that mix varies from day to day, it's not difficult to build up a regression model. 
and actually work out the, uni the unit price on each item. So to work out an appropriate amount to charge for sheets, an appropriate amount to charge for nurses' uniforms and so forth. And not long after that, I was doing some work for BHP, and now I, for the latter part of my time at uni, I spent most of my time actually, most of my consulting time, consulting with, with mining companies. And actually, if you're an academic, one great advantage of consulting for, for data-rich companies is that you have access to a whole lot of data on which you can generalize and uh, write papers. Whereas if you are um, going for a government grant, you spend a lot of time applying for that grant. If you're lucky enough to get it, you then might have to go to a company and say, can we do some study? And they're quite likely to say, what's in it for us? So if you're actually being invited in by a company, you, are, you can get so, uh, access to data that you otherwise wouldn't. But um, one of the problems was when you take a, this would be for iron ore, if you take iron ore and mine it, um, you commonly split it into a lump and a fines product. And the lump and fines products will have different compositions. The, the, the lump will tend to be richer than the fines. So you, um, they're wanting to predict how that split might be. And what they had been doing was equivalent to what even they'd been suggesting at the laundry, which was to run, if you run your laundry for a day with sheets only, you'd know how much a sheet cost. But it wouldn't be typical because you'd be running the laundry most inefficiently compared to having the normal mix. The same way here, what they had actually been doing for a long time was to run a full day with a single ore type and see how that actually split into lump and fines and use that as, the, in, as a forecaster for future work when they had a mixture. And that was quite expensive because it meant you were really having to run your, uh, your plant with only one ore type and so the other things were being held back. It had low statistical power because you had only one observation, which I suppose is some advantage because there's no error involved, is there? If you've only got one observation, you just take it as true. And it probably distorted the results because the um, equipment would not be behaving quite the same way as if you had the normal mixture going through. And again, it's, it was actually, I the way I managed to persuade them that it was worth using a regression analysis was by giving them a short lecture on hospital linen laundry service, which kind of caused some amusement to them. Uh, but actually, it is a totally analogous situation. And we solved it by regression analysis. And it also proved relevant for the beneficiation plant. That uh, when you have the beneficiation plant, you're trying to predict the upgrade from an input type, and or the iron ore comes in and some flotation method or, or whatever is used to um, try and separate the richer material from the, from the less rich. You're trying to predict what that upgrade might be. And again, you can do it by regression analysis of past behavior. And you get something that's statistically far more powerful than if you just try to run it for one day on one particular type of material. Another example that I might give um, there is still a company called Cuffpeg. You probably see, I think they're in West Perth somewhere. The Kuwait Foreign Petroleum Exchange, uh, Kuwait Foreign Petroleum Exploration Company. And they're a subsidiary of um, the major, their parent company in Kuwait. And it was highly centralized. They, they, every, every year, the local company had to send back all their data, all their financial data and so forth, for processing in Kuwait. And that was fine until 1990, because they, all the software was backed up. And it was backed up at the bank manager, at the managing director's home, presumably, uh, some software company, all in Kuwait, but backed up. And so during the Iraqi invasion in 1990, it was all lost. And you often get this idea that, oh, if we can do this and there's a one in a thousand chance of this going wrong, and we can take another precaution that's got a one in a thousand chance going wrong, there's a one in a million chance of trouble because either one or the other will survive. That's only true if the two chances are independent and multiply. And of course, they were not independent. All the multiple places where they'd stored the software died uh, when, the, when the Iraqis invaded. And the local company here, it was a bit like the fall of the Roman Empire, the local company here suddenly had to do their analysis and didn't have the software to do it with. 
And uh, I'd known one or two of the people there when we, both worked, when we all worked at Woodside. And they got me in to write some of the software in a hurry for them. So it was lovely because it gave me a nice consulting job and also a teaching example. The problem with it as a teaching example was it wasn't many, more, many years before students said, 1990, Kuwait, what was that? And they'd, you know, they'd, they'd been in primary school at the time that, um, that it had actually happened. So you've got to keep your examples updated. Um, the concept of opportunity cost, I think, is more generally recognized now. But I must admit, uh, I had, uh, one had a long argument with engineers 20 years ago as to um, opportunity cost. You're, you're producing uh, ore to a target grade. And you're wanting to reach target grade, target levels within a, within a tolerance. Usually, that will be a target not only in iron, but also silica, alumina, and phosphorus. So you're trying to produce ore that comes out matches that target grade, because it's going to go into a blast furnace. The blast furnace is tuned to a particular grade of ore. Now, people would often then, I don't think they would now, oh gee, what happened here? Does that come on again, John? Yes. I think it's one of those delayed things where if you do it twice, you've undone it here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so, if you exceed your target, you get engineers to say, well, that doesn't matter. We, we've, we've made them very happy. But if you exceed your target, you've reduced other opportunities. If you send out ore that is too good in quality, you could have mixed it with ore that was below target and made it up to target. So that um, there is an opportunity cost if you, um, if you exceed your targets. And as Terry Howard, a colleague at, um, at BHP, I used to say to me, uh, the, the objective is to please customers, not to delight customers. And as a consultant or as in any, any task, that, that is really true. Otherwise, you are suffering from opportunity cost. Actually, that brings me up to a point that I should have mentioned earlier. Whenever you're doing any consulting work within a company, you have to have a, a mentor and or a champion within that company. Somebody high up who can actually make sure that it works, and also, or you know, can pull the levers so that you get the resources that are needed, and also somebody you can work with who is part of the community, not uh, just somebody you're doing it for. And uh, so I think a, they can be the same person, they can be a mentor and a champion, or often they're better to be two different people. But you need to be able to identify those in the company you're working with. Another problem that came up at Port Hedland um, was uh, ship loading. The policy then was to load ships from stockpiles according to some predetermined plan. But they'd take assays as they were loading a ship and they're monitoring that grade. They would, if, the, if it was appearing to go off target, they would change their source spot stockpile and go to another stockpile. And in fact, there were people who were in charge of this were rung up in the middle of the night saying, can we change stockpile? And yes, they would say, because the assays were going off. And it would look as if what you were generating was perfectly uh, on target, because you'd done this modification as you went along. But customers were reporting that uh, although the port records look good, they, when they assayed it, when it arrived, it was more variable. The immediate response to this was, oh, well, these customers are pretty, you know, here, there, and everywhere, and they aren't all that accurate, and it's, it's it's measurement error that they're meeting. But um, the change, the, we finally managed to bring in a change of approach where you just stuck to the original plan and ignored the assays that came along. Use them for reporting, but not for changing your behavior. And it turned out that although the port records now looked worse, when we reviewed it a year later, the customers were now much happier and their variability was, respond, was corresponding to the variability the port was getting. It's a fairly subtle point, and it took some explanation, but the best analogy is to think of shooting at a target. And if you shoot at a target and you miss a bit, so you adjust your aim to compensate for the error that you've just made and do it again and do it again, it's not difficult to show that actually your variance gets larger and larger without limit. 
if there's just random error in where you actually fired. And uh, so by just aiming at the bullseye, and unless you detect a systematic error, just keeping on aiming at the bullseye will be more accurate than responding to the mistake you made each time and correcting for it. But the, the worst problem of all was actually the psychological problem. And the people who most objected to this change were the people who tended to be rung up at two or three in the morning to be asked for permission to change stockpile because their job was threatened by it. And yet, actually, they were the ones who were most inconvenienced by it, too. But the change was instituted, and uh, I believe it still goes on that way. Um, another area that I want to talk about is selecting of uh, ore tonnage. That uh, if you've got a block model for an, for an iron ore prospect, and marketing defines some target grade that we want to get out of that prospect, what we want to do is to find the maximum ore tonnage at that target grade. And what we should note is that ore selection is not the same as ore sequencing. And I am talking about an open pit thing here where everything within the, or the pit boundary will have to be dug out and either go to waste or ore. Having decided what is ore and what is waste, they then left the problem of in what order should you mine it. But that's another question. And what was commonly done, and I believe is still done by some companies, is just to, to select, to say, we'll take as ore anything that satisfies a set of criteria. The iron must be above a certain, um, a certain grade. The alumina, for example, must be below a certain amount. And in the other dimensions that you can't see here, the silica and phosphorus must each be below some cutoff value. So you get, in effect, a quadrant, multidimensional quadrant, within which your ore is acceptable. Now, it's not difficult to show that that is absurd, because if you think of all these things that you're rejecting because they, are, so they lie outside the quadrant, if you put them all into one lump, they'd give you that red splodge, which would be within. So any criterion that is inconsistent is wrong. It's a necessary but not sufficient condition that a criterion be consistent. And in fact, you can show that you want to select everything to the right of a slanting line like this, which perhaps would be moved over a bit, so it actually would be parallel to that. And anything beyond that, uh, if you pick the appropriate slopes, gives you target grade and gives you maximum tonnage at target grade. And how to do that, you select the ore. If, well, what, what you had with that slanting line was, in effect, a, a composite function. Uh, the iron minus so much times the alumina minus so much times each of the contaminants had to be bigger than some cut-off value. And what we do would be to iterate over the coefficients A, B, and C. Uh, uh, and at each iteration, we'd accumulate the tonnage and descending, um, descending value of that composite function. And then calculate the stress against tonnage. So as we accumulated the tonnage, at each tonnage, we calculate what the stress for each um, uh, analyte was. And the stress is defined as a grade minus the target divided by the tolerance. We'd, so we'd square those and add them together, and we'd find the minimum total square stress. And if you could get that total stress down to zero, then of course you'd have uh, ore that was spot on target. So if you do that, if you start off, for example, with the, with the composition function just saying the, uh, the coefficient for iron is one and all the others are zero, so in effect you're just in decreasing order of iron, your stress stays quite large. And then as you gradually iterate and play around with changing the coefficients, you gradually eventually get to a point where the total stress is virtually zero. Remember this total stress here is a logarithmic scale and you're down to a very small stress then. So you found that for this particular prospect, the maximum tonnage is 298 million tons um, when you use this uh, composite, composite function to, so everything above a a certain value for that composite function will be ore and everything below it will be waste. Sorry. Yes, sorry? So those four coefficients, they are defining what the space in there is that open space where all the, <coughs> the elements considered are in proportion where it's... Uh, yeah. Um, if you work out for each block that composite function, 
which would be iron minus 2.09 times the alumina minus 1.95 times the silica minus 92.5 times the phosphorus. If that was above a certain value, you call it ore. If it's below a certain value, you call it waste. If you add all the ore together, you've got the maximum tonnage that is the target grade. Is, is that? Yep. Yeah. And if you then plot, when you're using that composite function, as you plot each of the analytes, you find that as you get to that um, 298 million tons, you're spot on the target grade for each of the, uh, for each of the analytes. One problem with this is we've been talking about maximizing the tonnage at a target grade. Now, a block is ore if its marginal value is greater than its marginal cost, where the marginal cost is the cost of processing and transport, not the cost of mining, because even if it's waste, you've still got to mine it. So it's the extra cost of, if you're calling it ore, you've got to perhaps put it through some sort of process, and then you have to transport it to the ship. And the value and the cost are encountered simultaneously. Whether you mine it in 10 years' time or tomorrow, you're going to meet the value and the cost simultaneously. So there's no discount rate involved. And this uh, question of value and cost is independent of time, unless, the, of course, the value of the ore changes. But unless you can forecast that, you're probably best just to say it's today's value anyway. But do remember that ore selection is not ore sequencing. And it may well be that having identified what is ore, then the order in which you get it out may change the value of the mine. But it won't change, but uh, the order in which you get it out won't change whether a particular block is ore or waste because the cost of mining and its value will be encountered at the same time. And you can expect the value to be a linear function of grade because total grade is a linear blend of block grades, so at least within a small ra ra range you'd expect the value to be a linear function of grade, but it's unlikely to be the same as that comp function that we found to maximize the tonnage at a predetermined grade. So target grade, maximizing the target grade tonnage is unlikely to yield you maximum value. And to take a realistic example, this is a composite function that we were just looking at for a particular um, prospect in the Pilbara. This is the block value where, admittedly, you could argue about what the value function is. What we've done here is just take the, uh, because there's a tolerance specified for each um, analyte, we've taken the inverse of the tolerant to be, tolerance to be um, proportional to the value. I mean, if, for example, silica has half the tolerance um, of iron, then it's reasonable to say that the penalty for an extra percent of silica is twice the penalty or the benefit of an extra percentage of iron. So um, in that, this particular example, all these blocks are what you get to maximize the tonnage of the reference grade. But these blocks that you've sent off to waste because they're below the comp cutoff, these blocks have, have value that's quite comparable to what you're taking. So clearly you've not maximized the value of the prospect by predetermining the target grade. And in fact, it should be done by some sort of joint conversation between marketing and the, the, the people producing, because uh, you can't really say what the optimum grade to produce is without taking account of the properties of the prospect itself. It isn't something that can be imposed by the market alone. So to get back to more generalities, a lot of work, uh, a lot of uh, what people do is based on anecdote. They tend to, believe, to remember when such and such went wrong and try and make sure it never happens again. And also hunting, where I mean, the classic example is two engineers in a room with an air conditioner. One gets up because it's too cold, another one gets up because it's too hot, and the oscillations get bigger and bigger. So we tend to respond to outstanding events and, and anecdotes. And that's one advantage of a statistical approach. At least it takes the personality away from it. But we do have to remember that correlation is not causation. If two things correlate, it doesn't follow that A causes B. It could be that B causes A. It could be that both are caused by something quite different. And also, people uh, in doing those statistics 
often come up with saying, oh, this uh, correlation or this relationship is significant. But that correlation, even if significant, can be misleading for two reasons. One is the effect might be quite significant, but too small to be meaningful. I mean, who cares if um, we get 0.1% more um, ore out of this because we found a significant relationship, if our uncertainties are plus or minus 3% anyway? So it can be a waste of time to uh, spend a lot of effort on significant effects that are very small. But also, one thing that, isn't, that often is not realized, if you take 100 random relationships, one of them, will, can, on, you can expect one of them on average to be significant at the 1% level, and five of them to be significant at the 5% level. And uh, how this often comes up, and it happens more, I found, in social science uh, um, research than it does in scientific research, but I think it happens in, in scientific areas too, and that is somebody takes uh, 20 variables and does a cross-correlation table on them. Then you will have actually, in effect, there will be a block 90, half of 19 by 20, so there will be 190 correlations. If those 20 variables are totally independent, you'd have 190 independent correlations, and two of them would probably be significant at 1%, and uh, 40 of them at the 5%. And yet you see an enormous number of papers that have in effect been written that way because people have said, oh, let's look at all these variables, let's correlate them, let's pick out which ones are most significant. You've really got then to go back in again and see with a new set of data whether you actually get the same effects again because you can generate uh, um, relationships that are purely spurious. Another aspect one should think about is batch operations. One big change uh, at BHP over the years has been to stop thinking about uh, stockpiles as batches where you don't worry when you're beginning, at, beginning to build a stockpile and then near the end of the stockpile everybody gets worried because it's not coming on grade so the port sends a message to the mine, please send down such and such so the mine has to keep all sorts of particular mixtures of ore around so they can satisfy what might be wanted at the last moment. So batch operators tend to lead to start and, start and stop, that you put a lot of effort early on, uh, sorry, late on in the stockpile, and then maybe it arrives too late to fix that stockpile, and it's the beginning of your next problem. So the solutions to yesterday's problems may be the beginning of tomorrow's problems. And you get irregular attention. Instead of putting a constant effort in, you have a periodic effort. It's much better if you can recast the problem as a process rather than a batch. So you got, oh gee, Willikins. <coughs> Maybe because I hit it twice. If I hit it once, it'll come on. Yep. Um, they must be on some sort of time thing. Uh, anyway, um, so with process operation, you, with a continuous objective function that you're trying to control all the time, that allows smoother operation. And I think an example of that is comparing constraints with a smooth objective function. Let's say your ore has to lie within, or you've got a tolerance that the iron, for example, or no, let's say the alumina, must lie within this particular range, plus or minus. And if it lies outside, and this used to happen, if it lay just outside, all hell would break loose. There'd be inquiries into why a ship was sent off out of target. If it was just inside, nobody would worry. Whereas in truth, if it lay outside because of measurement error, it might actually have been inside. And if it lay just inside because of measurement error, it might in truth have been outside. Much better to uh, have something like stress. And also the problem is you were looking at each analyte separately. And because of anecdote, you might have thought, oh, we really have to watch the alumina in this. And uh, while you're doing that, the silica comes up and bites you in the backside. So if you can get some sort of objective function, that has all the constraints uh, put it together and in a, in, a object in a smooth manner so you're not jerkily responding to being out of grade but increasing stress as you go out of grade and if you define stress for each analyte as being target minus the actual or grade minus the target divided by the tolerance and square it so you've got a dimensionless value so you can add all those squared values together. You've got a dimensionless total stress, 
which you're trying to minimize. If you got it down to zero, you'd be spot on target in every analyte. And if it's, beyond, uh, if it's within one, you know that you're not outside tolerance in any analyte. And the more it goes up here in a sort of quadratic way, the more pressure you put on to getting it back to target. You have a much smoother process system instead of a batch system if you do that. Another thing I got involved with uh, was uh, the ISO standards. You know, you've all met ISO, I think, which is the International Standards Organization. Uh, they have a standard for actually measuring, reporting the error in your laboratory in uh, measuring um, assays. And their recipe for it, which goes to many pages, uh, tells you to use mean absolute deviation rather than root mean squared deviation for, ex for uh, um, estimating variances. Now, if you do that, you can actually, and they give you a formula to convert the mean absolute deviation to a variance, it's, and the variances should then add up if they're normally distributed and independent, because you're trying to get the variance, well, what the whole purpose of this is, is not only to get the total error, but the error that's due to sampling and to measurement and to preparation separately. Uh, the, you can only convert the mean absolute deviation to root mean square deviation if you can assume that the, ver that the errors are normally distributed. Whereas if you use a root mean square deviation, so long as the various uh, effects are independent, preparation, measurement, and sampling, then um, you, can, you can add the variances. So in using mean absolute deviation, you've introduced um, some big problem. And the reason why they use mean absolute deviation is because people started doing this when computers were not cheap or easily available, and to cal calculate a root mean square deviation takes a lot more work for, to do it manually than mean absolute deviation. But on a computer, it doesn't. So what is the point of using mean absolute deviation? And yet, it's still in the ISO standard. And they also tell you to remove outliers. They tell you to remove outliers and then recompute. And if you remove outliers without identifying the cause and repeat the data collection, then you're underestimating your variance. And you get a grossly optimistic estimate of assay error. And what you really need to do is to remove your outliers and then or identify your outliers, identify the causes remove the causes, and then make your measurements again. You can't recover a set of data where you've removed outliers from. And then types of paradigm problems, just to finish off. Ooh, sorry, I'm running over. Um, you've got alternative paradigms in small worlds. And uh, the reason for that is lack of communication with colleagues. Partly it's due to industrial secrecy, though it's a little bit false in a way because you know, people keep on popping up from one company into another and take their secrets with them. Um, problem representation could be inadequate, a simulation could be too detailed like that tobacco one, or people can be unaware of more powerful models, or there may be an invalid or inefficient heuristic like that Kuwait one where we assumed independence and thought we were pretty safe because all the probabilities were multiplied together, inappropriate treatment of error like in the ISO standards, or inappropriate objective function and constraints. We really need to avoid discontinuities and treat things as process rather than batch. And I think it helps if you can convert constraints to, f to components of your objective function wherever possible. I mean, there will be some constraints of the absolute, but generally, if you can make them continuous, you've got a much smoother system. And thank you. Any questions?